Hello, my brothers and sisters. Hello, my parish. After now a very, very long hot summer break, it's about time for a new serial. This time I will tell you the funny history of how and what happened after Europe became Christian. I will call this serial the funny religious history of West Europe. You can watch in the playlist Brother Dominic Serials on my channel page my older serials like What Religion to Choose for My Children, uh, Masturbation in Religion and Philosophy, and the Christianization of the Vikings and Scandinavia. So with now a lot more experience this will be also a lot more funny but also as much educational than before. Have fun and let's start now. Dominique, Nick, Nick, s'en allait tout simplement au Dieu, pauvre et chantant. En tout chemin, en tout lieu, il ne parle que du bon Dieu, il ne parle que du bon Dieu. Dear Parish, today we're gonna clear up why we are the so called Christian Occident. Why we are the Occidental Christian culture or also the evening land, how we call it here. So maybe this is because in our countries culture like theatre, cabaret, comedy club and opera happens always in the evening. So in the Orient, in the morning land, they have maybe more matinees or morning representations. Well, the Muslim don't know very much about cabaret and satire. And this is because when he had to choose between minaret and cabaret, he chose the minaret. We are the Christian Western civilization the Occidental culture because of the Merovingian king and Frank ruler Clovis, the first son of Childerich. This Clovis himself, he was a god. And yes, this was possible to his time. It was possible to be human and as well to be a god. Look, Caesar, he was also god and emperor. This was like a learned profession. You could learn to become a god. So, when you see, therefore, still today, at least for the Frenchmen, uh, so to behave as they were themselves gods is still a very big part of their national personality. Me? So, even me, when I come after a church meeting from my pub, everybody says, Oh my god, brother Dominic, what are you pissed? Yeah. Uh, so, now this is maybe the time to explain my accent. I am from Luxembourg, and when God reserved and distributed the languages, he gave German to the Germans and Austrians, French to the French, Spanish to Latin America and Spain, and English to all those who were not able to learn a second language. Yeah, just as Luxembourgian, he had forgotten. And since there were no more languages to distribute, God said, you know what, speak simply how I do. Clovis, even as a god, heard about that south there were something called Christianity. And he asked from some brochures and information material about this new tendency. So when he looked 
at those prospectors, he nearly died from laughing when he saw this uh, Jesus hanging on the cross. Well, yes, you have to see him as a strong Germanic Frank. So, what, he said, this is a god? This starving freak on the cross is a god? If the sun looks like this, I don't even want to know how the father looks alike. This was nothing for us Germanics. We imagined our gods much more quiet and also far more robust. And we Germanic, we had also a far bigger choice. We had a god for every weekday. So Donar, Thunderday, Thursday, Freya on Friday, Thor on Saturday. Even today there is still the German folk of the Thorinians, which means the sons of Thor. So, you see, a religion with only one god, this was nothing for us. Now, also fact is that those monotheistic religions, Judaism, Islam and Christianity, were invented in the desert. And this is also not a prodigy. So, imagine only if you starve for a whole day on a pile of sand. I'm sure that every one of you would have similar ideas and such a religion everybody would be able to invent by himself as a single person. But here in the north, with such an abundant nature, with this huge biodiversity, with millions of animals and plant species and what not, this is not an invention from only one person. Our old religions were a teamwork. A whole development department has worked on our beautiful myth. Apart of all this, those monotheistic religions from the desert were absolutely not attractive for us because these are three bellicose religions. These religions cause trouble since they exist. Constantly, something is blowing up. Yeah, which sounds pogroms, crusades, Israelis, Palestinian, Islamists, bombing. The other look at Taoism, Buddhism, Shintoism. Quiet. You never hear from them. They are simply functioning. Like a Japanese car. A little boring, but very realable. Because they are constructed with a cool head. But those three from the desert, I think it has to do with the heat there. Come on, seriously. Making religion with over 50 degrees Celsius in the shade? You simply shouldn't. It's too hot. I don't want to say directly that this monotheism are a heat damage of religious history, but look at you. When have you tried for the last time to mean a long conversation while sitting in the sauna. Those important religions from the desert to our region, where it rains every day, it doesn't fit with us. Let's come back to Clovis and more especially his wife Clotilde. Clotilde said, you know, my godly husband, I find this Jesus really sick. He looks like Hugh Jackman. 
well, the Hugh Jackman of his time, maybe. Um, I get me baptized. So, this became then a mixed marriage. Woman, pious Christian, and man, a happy pagan. Well, this is maybe like today Catholic being married to those evangelicals. Yeah, this might be possible, but what happens when the first child is born? Today still an ecumenical baptism isn't possible, even though the baptism as such has nothing to do with the confession. So maybe the spiritual composition of the different holy waters does not mix. The same happened for Clovis and Clotilde. They had to take a decision. What can I say? Like in real life, the woman won the debate and the firstborn son of Clovis was baptized. But listen, one day after the baptism, the child was dead. And Clovis said, see, what a shit religion. This faith does not work. I stay with my old Germanic gods, with them I know what I have. But now came the turning point in history. Now came the Battle of Tolbiac, the battle against the Alemanni. Clovit calls his god, um, well, only those in duty for war, and he said, attack, all men follow me, everybody against the Alemanni. And what can I say? A total mess, a total fail. His god fails on every border and he's threatened to be rolled over and near Tolbiak he finds him in a hopeless situation and is in total despair. This was the hour of Clotilde. You couldn't leave her at home. <laughs> well, see, what I taught you? Your old gods became untrustworthy. No, you do some test prayers. No, you do a Lord's Prayer and three Hail Mary. Don't give up. Uh, and this is the time to do a consumer test. Hmm. Clovis gave it a red through, and as Germanic he read, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed among women. <laughs> what a mess! For a Germanic, this was like, like, like if today the Pope would sing from his balcony. C'est la lutte finale, coupe en nous et demain, l'international sera le genre humain. Well, you know what I mean. But he did. Um, uh, not the Pope, I mean Clovis. He jabbered these prayers like a machine gun and what can I tell you? He won the battle. And Clothin said, Wow! Damn! This I would not even have thought. <laughs> After this, no choice, Clovis got baptized in the year 498 in a chapel near today's Cathedral of Reims in Champagne, France. How you see, on this painting, this was already a very voyeuristic procedure at this time. The wife you see behind there, this is Clotilde. Clovis' kingdom reached from the North Sea to the Pyrenees. It was a very, very big kingdom. So, this is why we are today the Christian Western culture, and this was also the beginning of France and Germany. 
Slowly, the whole kingdom became Christianized, because Clovis was now a Catholic. To Christianize, the common people took for some centuries more, because we didn't want this desert religion. The common people joined not voluntary Christianity and remained pagan for a lot more time. This new religion needed to be beat into the common people because for a very long time it wasn't allowed to believe what you want to believe. This because humanism wasn't invented yet. The next 500 years were gracefully used to beat Christianity and more especially Catholicism in the head of the common people. Just enough to convince them that hell and heaven exist and that everybody had to take care of their souls. In the old Germanic religion the soul wasn't that important because the goal was to arrive with the whole body to Valhalla. Now, this soul had to be purified from all personal sin and even from a sin that someone has made thousands of years ago. Fortunately, this convincing work was done in the year 1095 to recruit enough sinners to make a little trip to liberate Palestine from those unfaithful who occupied our ruler's straightways to East Asia. Commonly, these adventures were called the Crusades and granted a remission of sin for everybody able to join and to liberate this holy land. Let's make another jump of 500 years to these two important persons in history, Martin Luther and Johannes Calvin. No, I said 500 years. Sorry. The work of this gentleman and the renaissance of humanism by people like Erasmus of Rotterdam meant whole Europe in a 30 year long war which resulted in 8 million dead. Dead to fights, certainly, but also hunger and the pest helped a lot. Countries like Denmark and Sweden lost two thirds of their population only because they sent so many troops to this war, which was fought mainly on the territory of the Holy Roman Empire of German nations. Imagine the common peasant. Sometimes it happened that one day, when the Catholic League had won, he had to be Catholic, and the other day, when the Protestant League won, he became Protestant, and this during 30 years until the treaties of Osnabrück and Münster. But what happened meanwhile to make Christianity tasty for us? Germanics, yeah, just saying Anglo-Saxons were also Germanic, like the Dini, which became the Danes, or the Normans. Well, Christianity gave us some of our Germanic holidays we liked so much back. Like Christmas. Christmas this has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. This is the day where we have our winter solstice. Yes, this was the day where we were happy to see the days become longer again. Sure, in the desert you don't celebrate such days. There you are happy to see days shorter, days where the sun burns less on your skull. Yes, Christianity noticed that in this period of the year they had something like an event vacuum and then decided to score some points with the Germanics by offering to celebrate the birth of Jesus at this day. Many other days would fit better to this history of Jesus, but no matter, the main thing is to offer a celebration. The same thing happened with our celebration of spring. Our goddess Ostera became Easter. 
For us, they transformed this Christianity so much that you can't even see today the originality that it came from the desert. Even on our pictures, Jesus don't look like Arafat or Osama bin Laden or Gaddafi, which would be normal with his origins. No, he looks always like Jude Law or Owen Wilson. The desert is a way, but the saints, the celebration, the frank essences, every day, they remain with us. In the next chapter, we will see another desert religion which is since a long time in Europe. Even in the war of 30 years, the Muslim of the Osman Empire fought on the side of the Protestant coalition. As you have seen, we had to change our religion very often, and only by chance, not more often. Only to remember, the Mongols were with a breakneck speed on their way to West Europe. If their leader, De Mucin, which means the blacksmith, or he's better known as Genghis Khan, didn't die, he would have ruled over whole Europe. Yep, fortunately he died and everybody from his tribe went back to Mongolia for his burial and forgot to come back to finish his work. Imagine today we were all called Mongoloids if he had won. Well. And then, remember, Charles Martel Martel the Hammer, if he hadn't beaten Abdul Rahman al Ghafiki in the Battle of Tours, Europe would be invaded from Andalusia or Spain, how it's called today. And then again, in the Battle of Vienna, when the Turks from the Ottoman Empire stand before Vienna and brought us for the first time our yummy coffee. Mm, and this was scarce again. The absolutely ununited Europe just fought them back at the last minute. To celebrate uh, this, the baker mans of Vienna invented the croissant. <laughs> And so, we still today eat a half moon in honor of this one battle. Be happy to have today your alarm clock. If they had won, your morning awakening would sound like this. Believe me, even I don't know your actual music taste, but you would get used to this. So, if, how it nearly happened three times, we were Muslim, the question would be, are we no more evangelic or more Catholic Muslims? Yes, because with Muslims you have to know that they are all different and also somehow they believe all different. From Indonesia over Morocco to Arabia you can't put them all in one label. And this is because they don't have a Pope. And all this began with Mohammed. Okay. Let's take this as Mohammed, because how we learned in the caricature fight and from South Park, you are not allowed to make a picture for him. And anyway, it's maybe healthier for me to use this sign. 
Muhammad let write in the Quran that every man has the right to marry four women. And this was certainly a good argument to convert our old Germanics faster to the Quran than to the Bible, if they had known this. This rule is for every Muslim, only Muhammad himself was out of this rule from God and had 16 wives. Yes, God himself allowed him in a revelation to make this exception. Ha, he was a master to let approve his cravings from God. He was completely different from Jesus. Mohammed was a joyful, sensuous, bon vivant. He liked beautiful women, good food, and everything of this in mass. But look at Jesus. Women? No. He always preferred the company of men. Whatever. And? We have to add to this that Muhammad was a successful, wealthy, even rich businessman. When he became a prophet, he already was a one percenter of wealth. Jesus, he came from a very poor background. Look even today, if you have a holy nativity at home, there is always the fourth wall in the crib missing. So, Christianity was for the first 300 years a religion for the poor, even for the poorest of the poor, for losers. You see the difference? Islam was directly government religion. Mohammed was a charismatic statesman, and Islam spread directly as fast a camel can run. Islam was a modern religion. During this time in Europe, our clergy lived in fornication. We had witch burnings, crusade, industrials, trade, and whatsoever. If you want an example, look at the Council of Constance, and the link is below. To honor this event, they erected a statue from the noble courtesan Imperia, with in one hand the Pope, and in the other the Emperor. And this is how they lived at this time. Churches were more brothels than prayer houses. During a time while in Islam, universities were created. The main achievements during this period we received from Islam, algebra, decimal numeric system, Dunar kebab, and freedom of religion. Muhammad had declared no obligation in religion. Jews and Christians were allowed to keep their faith on the Muslim territory. Well, yes, I have to admit they had to pay a um, capitation tax. Yeah, a hair tax. And this is a very good concept. If the revenues are okay, tolerance isn't a problem. You see, this is what all the churches are doing wrong today. They take the money from their own members. This is hell stupid. And this is why so many people left the Christian churches. You must take the money from the others, from the pagans, the Jews and the Muslims. In Muhammad's days, this was so. If it became too expensive for Christian and Jews to pay, they converted to Islam and contributed also to spread this religion. But when such a charismatic leader dies, first everything goes downhill for a while. After the death of Muhammad, Islam made no difference and went downhill for a while. 
I need now more space to explain this right how it really was. Therefore, follow me to my basement with my special hydraulic floor. Okay. Here we have a green wall. Green, the color of Islam, the color of hope. Green because in the desert after a rain everybody is happy to see some more green. So here again, Mohammed. Now he died and his successor became his father-in-law, Caliph Abu Bakr, followed by Umar and then Uthman and then already followed the famous Ali. So what happened now? Abu Bakr died after a short time probably from poison. Umar was killed by six knife stabs in the belly. Uthman was killed by some heavy strokes on his head and Ali was also stabbed to death. As the Islamist would say, they all died by a natural death. So the history of Islam began with a serial of murdered caliphs and this is still important today. Because some Muslims say, look, Ali, he was married to Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad. So as son-in-law of Muhammad, he is the regular successor of the Prophet. And all the rest is shit. Therefore, they are called the Shihid. And they are normally dressed in black. And now the other. They say, moment, the first three are the legitimate uh, successors of Mohammed, so not, therefore so nit. <laughs> and they are usually dressed in white. To repeat, the first say, no, those first three are shit and therefore they are shit. The others say, so not, it's not Ali. It's the first three caliphs, and these are called the Sunnits. What kind of signification has this all for us? Whether we contribute to Europeanize Islam, like Atatürk began to do it in Turkey with separation of church and state, or Europe get Islamized. And yes, Europeans don't deliver children anymore and immigrants have traditionally more children. Earlier and younger they have children. In 50 years Muslim will have a 50% part on our population and in 100 years the Pope in Rome will sing from a minaret. Therefore, we have to resolve our inheritance dispute with Islam. Therefore, we have to go a secular, humanistic way and not build a so-called Christian, evening land, Western culture against Islam. Not harden the fronts on both sides, but meet together and build a common future. We have the power and the opportunity to support those who really know better. And I mean the moderate Muslims and the ex-Muslims. Look, why in Baghdad every day bombs explodes? This is a problem of inheritance dispute between the Shiites and the Sunnites about the legitimate succession of Mohammed. Sorry, but yes, I knew and I predicted this before the Gulf War, because I worked in the Middle East for some years. I knew if Bush 
goes down there and bombs Saddam Hussein away, he will have nothing won but a year-long civil war between Sunni and Shiite. And so came it. Bush didn't ask me. Maybe he didn't know me. Well, it's not forbidden to be an idiot, but at least you should not postulate for a presidency if you are an idiot. Inheritance. Yes, the problem is not only between Sunni and Shi'i, but also between all Muslims, Jews and Christians. The Muslims don't like that much that Christians don't worship only the one and only God Allah, like it's ordered in the Quran, but worship this combination between God Father, Son and Holy Ghost. So that God has a bodily son who's running with slippers and long hairs like a hippie on earth, that's absolutely not of the Muslim's taste. Then Mary, virtually a female goddess in the heaven. This is not foreseen in the Quran. For the Muslim, we are all doing pagan. Purely seen in religious history, the Muslim is right. Yes, we were pagans and we like keep it as before with our Germanic gods, even with our Christianity. So therefore, the Muslim believes that we are impure, the non-believers, and that we all going to hell. Well, that's not a problem. It's fine to have a place where we can meet all together, because with all these rules, who do you think really goes to heaven? What is now the fundamental problem of Judaism, Islam and Christianity? The problem is that those three religions from the desert are so closely related. In principle, those are only sects and cults from the same family. Christianity was in the beginning a small Jewish sect, became bigger, split first like all sex does between pagan Christians and Jewish Christians, then Roman Catholic, Orthodox, then Lutheran, then Calvinistic and so on, more and more splits. Islam is also such a split. They took over the Old Testament, even Jesus is in the Quran, but has been degraded from God's son to a simple prophet. So you see, they are all related, they are all a big family. And family is always a problem. First, there is harmony. Having coffee with parents, visiting uncles and aunt, enjoying family gatherings, and everything is fine. Until the day the parents die and the last will is opened. This day it's like a declaration of war. How does this come? At a succession it's not about money. It's not about those $20,000 the brother received several years ago and haven't been considered in the testament. No! In inheritance, it's always about curse and blessing from the ancestors. We all want our parents to love us. But if the brother received $20,000 more, this means automatically, automatically that the ancestors loved him for this amount more than they loved you. This happens in your subconscious. You can't avoid such feelings. This hurts you until your lives end. Because 
in ancient times we had our ancestors cult and we believed and worshipped our ancestors. This is still a problem for us today. And in religion this is absolutely the same. It's still ancestor worshipping. Up there everything is family. Godfather, son, holy mother and family and father Abraham. Yes, he also. He is the male factor. We are the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam and Christianity. We are one family fighting for the heritage of Abraham. Abraham or Ibrahim. Let's see how he was. Abraham was married to Sarah. Modern family, double income, no kids. Yeah, they had no children and could easily afford to hire a charwoman. So they had a slave called Haga. And this Haga was a super hot chick. Damn hot. Abram was since a long time in a kind of sexual hibernation because Sarah wasn't that active anymore and gave up the idea to become pregnant since a very long time. But Hagar, she knew how to help the old Abram out of his pants. So, nine months later, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. Now, Sarah sees the little Ishmael and, aha, the old cheated on me. And how it happens with women. She got a hormonal thrust and gave birth to Abraham's son Isaac. So you can read in the Old Testament, Abraham is split between those two women and had to take this decision. What can I say? It's like today in Abraham's time were also some social and cultural obligations. And so he decided to stay with his wife Sarah and his legal legitimate son Isaac. Jealousy of Sarah. Abraham was forced to ban Hagar and sent her in the desert. And therefore, Ishmael became the founder, or the founding father, of the Ishmaelite, the Arabs. In the Quran, this history is turned absolutely in the inverse. Abraham, in the Quran, recognizes the super bright Hagar and builds together with Ishmael the Kaaba in Mecca. What is now histor historically right? Only one of these stories can be right, and therefore they fight eye for eye in thousands of years. See today the Jews against the Palestinians, and always there is something to fight for in this region. But also Christians against Jews. This is the same case, all due to this inheritance fight. Let's take some example. Let's see the Pius brothers and this Holocaust denier Williams. People forget always that anti-Semitism is the core. It's the basic of the Christian business. In the Middle Ages, all monks and pastors preached, Jews killed our God. It's a work in God's will and it's God's name now to kill all these Jews. Therefore, these monks were made saints. And still, until today, they remain saints 
for having preached and having killed Jews. See, during the Holocaust, Pope Pius was quiet. He said nothing. And not even only that, he helped also the Nazi elite to escape through the Vatican to Argentina. In the Catholic Church until the late 70s in the Friday liturgy, so the Friday Mass, they still prayed in Latin for the perfidie judie, for the perfide unfaithful Jews. Our actual Pope has in the year 2007 reintroduced this form of Mass. And for the Easter Mass he prayed the shoes should recognize Jesus. What the bullshit. A Jew with Jesus is not longer a Jew. But always there is a subliminal message, an underground message in such a prayer. And this message is, like ever it was, Jews have nailed our Christ on the cross. The church should be happy that they did that. Without that, they would not have this corporation, this business, this, this firm. A small gratitude you should at least expect from the Pope for his job. All what we have seen so far are myth. And without myth, we human beings can't survive. But what's a myth? A mythophilos, and this is what Aristotle called himself, is a man who likes telling stories, and mainly stories with a lot of action. So like gossip, legends, sayings, epos, tales, fairy tales, political speech, those are told by mythophils, by storytellers. It's impossible to demythologize our society. During the Enlightenment, people thought this would be possible, but no. Without myth, we lose all our history and our histories. And without histories, the human being can't live. We are all, since our birth, involved in history. The more gods we had, so also the more histories we had. Our paradise was like a TV serial. A big choice of many characters and all these characters were interacting with each other. Monotheism, this is like one of those same TV serials but played by only one single character. Isn't this an ugly, boring idea? Watching a daily soap in 300 episodes with only one actor repeating time after time after time the same thing. Wouldn't this make you aggressive also? We need and we must allow to have many histories. If you consecrate yourself to only one history and you hold only this one and only this single history as the ultimate one, this is fundamentalism. See, in polytheism we hadn't had any religious war. The Romans didn't say to the Greeks that they are impure, that they are pagan and unbelievers. No, they said, well, Jupiter is about like Zeus, and so they melted their religions together. During this time, religion was a mean of communication. 
This was an enormous performance of tolerance. And this we would like to have back today. Today, the contrary is fact when people say that their only God sees everything and this is really like wishing to live in a state like North Korea. Polytheism was a far better concept. Imagine only if Jupiter asked you why you didn't worship him today. You could always say, oh, well, hey man, God Jupiter, I'm sorry, but I had no time because you know sent me to buy some cigarettes for him. Where was the problem? You see the difference? Since the beginning, when monotheism was invented, we had 16,000 wars because of religion. Only the Thirty Years' War was a horrible bloodshed because of evangelism or Catholicism. And due to this bullshit, we had more death than the First and the Second World War combined. Monotheism is the worst whatever happened to humanity. Nothing has ever wasted so many human lives than this rubbish. The experiment of monotheism was once made by the old Egyptians, by Echnaton. But when Echnaton died, the Egyptians went fast back to their polytheism and said, we don't want such a rubbish. They abolished directly this harmful idea because they knew it's far better to have more action in the world of their gods. And it creates a lot of jobs because every single of these gods has his own clergy. So after the Egyptians, monotheism was considered as the backfire of history and for a very long time nobody would ever consider to go back to this stupid concept. So we had for a long time peace and silence on earth. But then came the Jews. Well, the Jews were also polytheists. They also had multiple gods. The commandment who shall not have other gods before me makes absolutely no sense if there are not more of them. Then came the Babylonians to invade the Jews and said so, my dear Jews, now you take our gods. But the Jews didn't translate their gods how the Romans did with the Greek gods, no, they saved their own gods over to this new period of time. This became more and more difficult and one day only Yahweh remained rest. This Yahweh is also supposed to be the Christian God, the God of the Christian Western civilization. But originally with the Jews, Yahweh was not more than maybe today a department manager in a provincial Walmart branch. And then he worked up to become the solo entertainer of our times. Yes, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and said, ah, you know, let's make it simple, there's only one. I tell you his name, but I don't tell you how he looks like. Yes, because you should not make a picture of God. We also had this rule. And said Moses, I have a good and a bad news. The good news is I traded him down to 10. And the bad news, adultery is still in. Fortunately, the churches noticed that this monotheism still remained a mess. Yes, they directly changed this back to Father, Son and Holy Ghost and added 
the sweet Mary to them. Yes, because also the heavens need a wife and also has to be cleaned up sometimes. So now then they added all the hollies to them to let you know that the human still can become a god. Like Caesar or our Clovis. I remember uh, what George W. Bush said when Pope Benedict was in America. He said, when I see Pope Benedict in his eyes, I see God. Okay, Bush is evangelical. He couldn't have known that the Pope is only a vice God or, well, a deputy God. The Pope needs only one more promotion to get to this level. See, when the Pope drives through the streets with his Papa Mobile, how people acclaim him. Of more than a half million people in the streets to cheer him. With the evangelicals, this would be unthinkable. Imagine Adrian Rogers, the chairman of the Southern uh, Baptist Convention, driving with such a mobile through the streets. He would have less than 10 minutes a ticket because his seatbelt is not fastened. If it's the Pope, nobody would ever dare to give him a ticket. A god, pardon, a vice god, don't have to fasten a seatbelt. But okay, so the Pope drives through the streets with his car and blesses the crowd. This is Carnival. Carnival Carus Navalus in Latin. The car of the fool. Or today uh, Americans call this a SUV. The Pope drives a Mercedes SUV with a terrarium on the top. And he speaks about trust in God but has bulletproof glass. Why this is allowed to this Pope? Well, I will explain it to you. The Pope is Roman Catholic. So first he is Roman, then Catholic came on the second place, only because it's not so important. The Pope is one thing before all others, namely Roman. Now ask any, any theologian you might know. The Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost comes from the Roman Triad. Jupiter, Juno, Minerva. The Romans had it from the Greeks and by the Greeks it was Zeus, Hera and Athena. It's not only the Trinity or the Triad, but also our common sense that tells us a dictator, a single ruler is always bad. You have always to split the power, how it's normal in our democracy. It's very logic and useful for us today. What resulted from this Triad, the separation between executive judicative and legislative. And then, yes, I have to come back to our saints. Our saints who contributed very much to give us our politeism back. Freya became Mary. Well, it's not by coincidence that the saints were very alike our old Germanic gods. Very useful constitutions and institutions result also uh, from our saints. Entrance. Yes, entrance. The saints were the precursors of our entrance. 
Saint Florian for the fire entrance. Yes, he's the holy patron of the firefighters and the chimney sweeps. I remember the prayer from my childhood, Holy Florian, ignite other houses but spare ours. Or Saint Blaise, Blasius, Blasius for the health entrance. But also as saint, you can lose your job. The elder between us, brothers and sisters, can remember the time our cars had only two buttons, one for the, the wipers and one for the lights on the dashboard. And this dashboard was made entirely of metal. There was always enough space for a magnet medal with Saint Christopher. Saint Christopher, the airbag of the 60s. One medal of Saint Christopher for five passengers. So, what can I tell you? They abolished him. At the last holy reform in the Vatican, the Congregation of Faith has decided you can't pray anymore to Saint Christopher because he has never existed. What an arrogance, what an insolence from those ignorants in, in, in the Vatican. Maybe the saints never existed, but they helped. Entrance company really exists, but do they help? <sighs> that we are able today to make such rational calculations, this is a gain from the secularization. Before it was always nothing happens, some off, everything comes from above. But after the secularization, we were thrown on the unholy way of Darwin's evolution. <clears throat> because of Darwin, we lost this someone who has a special plan only with us. With Darwin, God became unnecessary and became a god for breaks and yeah, for happy hours. But at the long, people don't bear that science explain them everything away. One day, sooner or later, myth come always back. Why? No, I asked you be serious and honest. Have you really, really read Darwin's Origin of Species? It's an extraordinary dry lecture. Histories of religion are far more interesting. Let me give you an example. If now I would do a speech of two hours about a different, or the difference of uh, genotype and stenotype, this video would have less than 30 views. But if I promise you to show you the exclusive footage of the amazing 80s putting also an orange in his ass, I would have 2000 views in less than an hour. This is also an example how religion works. Yes, so was it with our old gods. Always something interesting happened with them. They cheated, they lied, they killed. It was always interesting to follow their stories. In the 70s, we began in Europe to import myth from the Americas, like only after the last tree has been cut down. Only after the last river has been poisoned, only after the last fish has been caught, only then will you find that money cannot be eaten. This wisdom is from the Canadian Creed. This was the Green Reformation, 
and none of the European typical hippie cars, the Citroen 2CV, was without a sticker with this wisdom. Since every reformation has a counter-reformation, you could see as soon stickers on bigger cars stating, my car works also without a forest. Only when we have eaten the last Big Mac, only when we have spent the last cent, you will see that you can't eat trees. So the human being eat both. It's an interplay between science and myth. And also therefore, God incurs a permanent change, a permanent facelift. Remember God of our childhood, the bearded controller on the window of the star's orbit who sees everything. Today, no more. Ask a priest, today God is more the spiritual sponsor and individually made for everyone's needs. Even if st some still struggle, the trend to a wellness religion can't be stopped anymore. This thing with eternal life, even most preachers don't believe this anymore. But religion has to bring something, has to bring something here, now, at this moment. So if we take a look at this freestyle religions, like in the USA, we have to admit our Princip Clovis prevails. If a faith doesn't work sufficiently, like with Clovis in the battle against the elements, another faith can and must be tried. Americans do this permanently. They have a whole supermarket of religion. And everyone with their own credit card, with their own payback card, which you can cancel at any moment, if you have paid back your credit. But before you let you seduce, go first to the myth consumer test. If you want to tempt a good person to do bad things, you have to guide them to religion. And you know from whom this quote is? It's from Pope Benedict XVI, but only when he speaks about Islamists and more particularly about those converted from Catholicism to Islam. Convertites are the worst. Yes, those people who choose going to another myth one had to learn about the reason. Jews, they know that. They don't want us to become Jew and they don't want convertites. This is not possible. Try to become a Jew. Therefore, you need a Jewish mother and this might be difficult after being born. Many Christians don't even remember that Jesus was a Jew. Even there are four irrefutable proofs of his Jewishness, and this proof are for the first. See, he lived 33 years with his mother. The second is, he believed his mother was a virgin for 33 years. Three, his mother told everywhere her son was our Lord. And he created a multinational business. If this is not a proof he was a Jew. Okay, fact is, people change their religions more often. Therefore, we need a um, best buy test also for religions, like car, motor, and gold. So, to check out how is Buddhism off road? How is Hinduism in flow passage? How reacts Christianity on snow? Has the hereafter leather seeds? Or 
Islam Compact, where is the space for the car bomb? And then, there is also the searching for meaning. Yes, where leads your GPS if you type in God? Well, I tried it. Mine in my city brought me to the Red Square. Yeah, and here we are again at the beginning. The burning Giordano Bruno at the Campo del Fiore in Rome was more than only a smoke signal. In the long run, religion can't prevail science. There will be always a day when an edifice of ideas breaks down under the evidence of science. Religion is a back donation. Some of those very old back donations are no more questioned. Well, let me compare it with a child play. Children have constructed with their mattresses a house, and for those children during their play, this is really a house. So they are deeply sunken in their play, in their reality for this moment. But then the parents come home and say, Ala, come on, now, quick, it's bedtime. And as soon the mattresses, who were a house before, becomes now a bed again. That's not pretty for children. But so are scientists. Adam and Eve, those from Genesis, up back in the toy box. The crazy is that just of all it was the Islam who claims this in the first place. Muhammad said every Muslim is obliged to search wisdom. Universities was created and we all benefited enormously from this seek of wisdom. But then, one day came those ayatollahs and muftis and said stop, everything what you have to know is written in the Quran. Science says from A follows B. They say from a follows B, if Allah wants it. But what wants Allah? To have an answer from Him, you have to wait for a very, very long time. The result of this, uh, not following Muhammad's rule, is that from 1000 scientists, only two are Muslim. So if they would like the Catholic Church enjoyed it so much, burn the scientists, they wouldn't even have enough to make even a little fire. Oof, how can I close? Maybe with the words of Stephen Hawking, science will win because it works. Or maybe you want to make it uh, a bet like the French mathematician Blaise Pascal. He betted on the eternal life because if he loses, he wouldn't even notice it. Like an agnostic taking the 50 50 joker. Anyway, what's rest of God in our old Europe? It's like a spiritual household insurance. The majority who holds on God does this, because maybe we're gonna need him one day, or nothing can be so bad that it can't be used for something else later. I really enjoyed this serial. Please leave me, if you don't have a comment, only a little smiley here down in the comment box that your name shows up and for once I want to see who follows my videos. 
all my videos are Creative Commons and so free for everyone to use for mirror or for quotes or for outtakes. I will now compile the whole series together and it will be posted maybe mid next week. Thank you very much for watching. The best I can wish you is caress you and thank you very much. Subscribe here, rate here, leave your comment.